good afternoon and uh, welcome to our, our session this afternoon, New Apologetic Challenges for the Future. And this will be an interview with, with John Lennox about uh, two of his most recent books. This event is organized by FOIR, the Fellowship of Evangelists in the Universities of Europe. And FOIR is a loose network organized by the IFES movement, which welcomes all those who are committed to the public communication of the gospel, persuasive evangelism, and public dialogue in European universities, believing that if under God we can change the universities, we will change the world. Now, you might be asking uh, who I am, uh, because I haven't been involved in all the foyer sessions this week. Well, at least maybe not the ones you have been part of. I've been part of the Academics Network, which runs in parallel. So FOIR has been running for 12 years, I think, and the Academics Network for five years. So my name is David Glass. I uh, work in computer science and mathematics at Ulster University. And I've been coming along to the Academics Network for these last five years. And the idea in the academics network is that there is a distinctive role for academics. There's a strategic opportunity to start the gospel conversation from further back. It's not merely a matter of holding Christian events, important as that is, of course, but that we can work within the university itself and at the same time give credibility both to the gospel and other vital evangelistic activities planned in conjunction. And so this is where the academics network fits into the wider FOIR movement. And so many academics, including myself, have had the opportunity to go and visit some of the mission weeks taking place. And we've been hearing some wonderful stories about what has been going on. So, so that's been a real encouragement to us over the last few days. It's my great privilege <coughs> in this session to introduce John Lennox. Now, he doesn't really need much of an introduction at FOIR because you all know him very well. But let me just state, first of all, that John is Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at Oxford and Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College. He's an internationally renowned speaker and has debated Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens and Peter Singer. He's the author of a number of books at the interface of science, philosophy and religion including two books that we'll be looking at this afternoon. We'll be looking, first of all, at Where is God in a Coronavirus World? And 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be with everybody in FOIR. And uh, you will notice immediately that we both come from the same country. That is an accident of birth. I can assure you that not all mathematicians come from Northern Ireland. I was thinking it was divine providence, John. But <laughs> before you go, well, uh, uh, whatever the reason, we're both from the same place and we're together this afternoon. So, so that's that's great. Um, John, it's it's been really great having your input into our academics network. But this afternoon, we want to focus on on your your two books. Um, before that, I just want to ask you about your, your, your time this year. And, and to start with, I, I'm going to read the opening words from your, your book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? We're living through a unique, era-defining period. Many of our old certainties have gone. Whatever our view of the world and whatever our beliefs, whether you were a Christian or not, the coronavirus pandemic is perplexing and unsettling for all of us. How do we begin to think it through and cope with it? So just before we begin to think it through, can I ask you how you have been coping with it? How has life been for you with coronavirus this year? And of course, in, in England, you're, you're back under lockdown again. Well, by definition, it's been a, a very strange experience. But right at the beginning, when lockdown was announced, I sat down and thought hard about what can I do? Uh, I'm in the vulnerable area at high risk and my wife at even higher risk. And I thought, what can I do? And the thought immediately came to me, perhaps it would be worth at least trying to write something. 
not that I've got a final solution because this is a hugely problematic thing. But as a mathematician, I could see that there's going to be exponential growth and that's going to be very scary for many people. And I thought perhaps I can write something because there will be lots of voices commenting on this. And as I believe and have believed for many years that Christianity has something seriously important to say about these things that's highly non-trivial. I sat down on a Monday and just worked and worked and worked and worked and somehow got an enormous amount of energy. And by Saturday night, I, I'd written this little book and by the next Wednesday, it wasn't print because the printers, Tim Thornborough of the Good Book Company, they just responded and said, we, we'll, we'll print this. And it's now in nearly 30 languages. So it does seem to resonate with people. But through this period of time, I've discovered the truth of what Paul wrote to Timothy when he was writing as a prisoner. And he said, but the word of God is not bound. And I've possibly spoken to more people sitting at my home during lockdown than in the past six months than I did in the preceding year, because I've done, it's coming up at 200 major Zoom conversations and things like that to many parts of the world. So it's been a huge opportunity for me. And <clears throat> during that time as well, uh, the film, my documentary film about my work is with um, Kevin Sorbo, the Hollywood actor, has been finished and has been shown once or twice. And it will be shown in cinemas in the USA on the 19th, 20th and 23rd of, of this month. So there's been a huge amount of interest in that. So th the point I'm making is that God's word isn't bound and the opportunities are abounding. And of course, this fire one, which is very special to me because I've been at most of the fires since their inception, is just marvelous to participate and to try and encourage my colleagues and more junior people who are getting into this. It's just wonderful to see you all. Yes, and uh, I think uh, it, it really is interesting to hear some of the stories from across Europe as to what's been going on online. And as you say, although we are restricted, the last couple of years we have been sitting in a venue at the front of a hall having this conversation. Uh, but but you've become a, a real expert on on Zoom <laughs> and so forth, and uh, and and yet this has opened up so many opportunities for you and for for many others. So uh, I think God is is clearly at work. Uh, what I, I want to do is just to think of a, a theme that I think is relevant to both books before we get into some of the details, John. And again, I'm going to quote from uh, your book on coronavirus. You write, when life seems predictable and under control, it's easy to put off asking the big questions or to be satisfied with simplistic answers. But life is not that way right now, not for any of us. It's not surprising that whatever your faith or belief system, the big questions of life are breaking through to the surface, demanding attention. Now, it seems to me that both of the books we're discussing this afternoon, really what you've done is that there's an opportunity because both of these topics have raised enormous questions. And in our academics network, uh, René uh, van Weidenberg from uh, the Netherlands has been encouraging us to think about what universities are about and that universities, really their mission and responsibilities involve asking these big questions. And so uh, for us at Foyer, this is something that we want to do, of course, in mission weeks and in public talks and lectures and so forth. And so this seems to be a real focus of both of your books is, is taking this opportunity to address the big questions. So I wondered if you would like to just comment on the importance of that and the opportunity that exists for us to do that at the present time. Well, René van Voudenberg's emphasis is enormously important in my view, and we need to listen seriously to, to, to what he has to say about this. 
You see, at, at the heart of FOIR and the academics network, but the whole general thing is, is building bridges. We, we want to, we, we start, we're academics, those of us on the academic network, but we're also Christians. And we need to build a bridge from our subject to the God question, and then much more specifically to, to Christianity itself. And when in the culture things happen that raise deep questions to which the Christian faith is immediately seen to be relevant, I think that's the opportunity to get in and at least try to get a seat at the table in people's thinking. The pandemic, for example, immediately raises the question of suffering and many deaths raise the matter of eternity. And it's not at all surprising to me that many ministers are reporting that their online church attendance is very much bigger than the number of people that came when they were meeting still physically in their buildings because people are concerned. They are asking these questions and therefore, we need with humility and with sensitivity, and that's vastly important in a suffering world, to step into this situation and to encourage people to think about the Christian position at the same time as we examine the, their own attitudes, whether their attitudes coming from atheism, which simply says this is evidence that God doesn't exist, or whether we get come to the fatalism of the karma type doctrines that say that uh, people are just suffering what they've done wrong in a previous life and so on. We really do have something to say. And similarly, the book 2084 on artificial intelligence, I got into that uh, some time ago because I have always been interested as a Christian in what we believe about the nature of human beings. I, I often describe my own concerns as circling around two very big questions. The first is, what is the status of the universe? Is it created or not? And there's the whole science religion debate. Then the second question is, what is the status of human life? Is it made in the image of God or not? And you will know from your own work in artificial intelligence, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it, that some aspects of AI, particularly artificial general intelligence, which is surrounded by massive hype, but it concerns the redefinition of what a human being is and modifications to the human specification. Now, of course, that is of immediate concern for anyone with Christian convictions. What do we have to say about what scripture teaches about the nature of human beings? And that is extremely important because many believers are nervous of Genesis. They're nervous of Genesis 1, but they're also nervous of, of Genesis 2. But if we simply take the statement that humans are made in the image of God. That's the bedrock. It's very interesting to watch Jordan Peterson wrestle with these things in his lectures on Genesis. And when he's talking about Genesis 1, he comes to the statement that God made humans in his own image. And he pauses and he says, that is the cornerstone of civilization. And then he just uh, hesitates a bit and says, man, we neglect this at our peril. And therefore, in an age when people are talking about genetic enhancement, genetic ma manipulation, uploading our brains and all these uh, highly speculative things, modifying the germline raises, for example, huge questions about what do we think a human being is. So just following on from that, when we think about this question of what a human being is, it, it does seem to me that in, in a lot of the work and a lot of the literature, and you've obviously read a lot of books about artificial intelligence. I mean, this must have involved a, a lot of work in your, your reading and studying around it. But but there is very definitely a, a, a clear worldview at work in a lot of this literature. And I, I noticed that um, Yuval Harari's uh, book, uh, Homo Deus, that played a 
obviously quite a, a role in your thinking in terms of a response to that. Now, a lot of this literature, including Hayes, is, is deeply rooted in a, a, a materialistic worldview. It's a reductionist view, isn't it, of who we are as human beings. And, and ultimately, I mean, that's one component of it. It's to think of who we are as purely material beings and trying to make sense of ourselves from that point of view, but also then trying to move beyond that. So really a big starting point for, for him, and, and you discuss this in your book, 2084, is that he, um, he, he then looks at, at some of these things such as, um, as death, for example, and wanting to overcome death. Now, we'll, we'll probably come back to that sort of issue later, but, but there is something almost like a sort of surrogate religion at work in, in some of these books, isn't there, where they're almost replacing, I think you call it a parody of, of Christianity. So um, th that worldview seems to be at, at, at work. And it, it, would that be true of a lot of this literature, would you say? I suspect that it is. Uh, I, as I got into this, of course, Harari immediately came to my attention. And his book, Homo Deus, Latin for the man who is God or a God man, is such a provocative idea. And of course, it's an idea that has resonated right since the beginning of Genesis, as far as the biblical uh, culture is concerned, the idea of humans becoming gods. And Harari's take on that is clearly driven, and he says so, by an atheist materialistic agenda. And his fundamental idea, as you hinted at, is that living things have been gradually developing since primeval times. We've passed through the animal stage, we got to the human stage, but we're not going to stop there because we are only a stage in that development. And we're going to move on to what is called these days transhumanism, beyond human. And Harari's two agenda items for the 21st century really helped me concentrate what's going on here. The first, and we can talk about it later, is the uh, solving of the death problem as a technical problem. But the second one is that the central agenda item will be the enhancement of human happiness. And uh, that resonates, of course, with, with many philosophies, uh, as you know, the idea of creating utopia, so that we move towards a, a world that's full of glory and happiness. And of course, uh, once I saw that Harari was interested in ab abolishing death and turning the world into paradise, immediately it occurred to me, but you know, Christianity promises not to abolish death, but tells us it has already been done. And secondly, it does hold out real hope of a world to come uh, that's full of glory, but isn't reached by the uploading of our brains or, or the fusing of them with a silicon base. So it seemed to me to be a wonderful opportunity and the way I look at it, David, is this. There are many scenarios out there for these futuristic kind of things. And I'd like to hear your assessment as to the liability or the likelihood of them happening. But they're very different. Will we create a super intelligence that is benevolent or will it uh, annihilate humans or simply keep a few around as pets? And people take those seriously and they're worried about them. Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and all this kind of uh, person, very concerned about them. And that raises huge ethical issues. But what I want to say into that as a Christian, and here I'm back to the bridge building, people are fascinated by these scenarios. And I want to say, I want to tell you about another scenario. And that's the biblical one. And before you start to get angry that it's irrelevant. Let me just say, firstly, that the ideas are there and what the biblical worldview promises is based on solid evidence that we've already got. Many of these speculative things in the future, we've got no evidence really that they're going to happen. 
But as far as the abolition of death is, uh, we, we have the resurrection of Jesus and then the credibility of his promises for the future. And I thought when I got into this, this is a wonderful opportunity to say things that are very rarely said mm -hmm. in the context of, say, a scientist talking about science and religion. And that is what the Bible has to say about the future that's credible mm -hmm. because it resonates with the scenarios that are going on in the minds of people who are interested in projections of transhumanist ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I find this intriguing in, in your book. And I, I was thinking about this just in terms of Foyer and the challenges and opportunities that perhaps exist at the, at the current time. Uh, I mean, the, the title that we were given today for, for this discussion was New Apologetic Challenges for the Future. Now, I, I, I think there is a, a new challenge and, and opportunity. And, and what intrigued me about your approach in this book is that in, in many of your, your other books, you have taken a, a particular subject like science and religion, and you have, have looked at both sides of the argument and you've presented your case um, uh, convincingly. In this book, you, you take quite a different tack. So it, it's it's different, I think. I mean, you, you can correct me if, if this is not the no. right way to understand it. But I think your approach is quite different here in that you, you don't really set out to, to make the case from the outset in a, a sort of more traditional apologetic way, if I can put it like that. Really what you're saying here is there are all these views on the table um, in modern society and in, in these a lot of these books that are presenting these different scenarios. And um, here, here, here is mine. I am entitled to come to the table with my worldview. And actually, as you've said, it, uh, it has a lot more credibility going for it. But this then opens the door for you to address all sorts of issues that we probably wouldn't normally think of in a lot of our um, work at, at Foyer. So we might think about arguing for the existence of God or the resurrection of Jesus. And, and of course, that's important. But you're talking about topics here like um, prophecy. You're looking at the return of Christ and the importance of that. You're looking at the, the book of Revelation. And so you, you address a whole range of themes that uh, we perhaps normally wouldn't think of in this context. Well, uh, uh, you're very perceptive in the sense that I hadn't quite thought about it in that way. <laughs> that illuminates me, what you've said, because what I started by doing, uh, trying to do, was to introduce artificial intelligence to an audience which would consist of Christians and non-Christians and anybody because there seemed to me to be so much confusion. I wanted to show them that there are aspects of AI that are extremely beneficial and wanted to actually encourage uh, scientifically minded young people to get into this field, not only to make contributions as in medicine, say searching for a COVID vaccine, but think seriously about the ethical issues that are raised, say, by facial recognition technologies and the suppression of the Uyghur population of China. These, these are vast questions that are being raised. And it was only when I began to read Harari's book that I suddenly thought, dare I talk about the claim that Jesus made that he would one day come again and spell it out a bit more. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, why shouldn't I? After all, one of the most striking things about the claim of Jesus to return is it's not a peripheral uh, element in the Christian faith. It's central in the sense that Virtually every book of the New Testament talks about it. But what really struck me with great force is where Jesus claimed it. In the sense that before he went to the cross, he told his disciples that he was going to go away and he would return to receive them unto himself. So privately to his disciples, he made it clear. But the most impressive thing to my mind was this issue was central as a reason why he was crucified. 
if I might just say a word about that, that when the high priest put him on oath and said, are you the, the Christ, the Messiah? He said, yes, you, you've said so. And I tell you, you shall see the Son of Man at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, the people that were judging him there, being experts in the ancient text of the Old Testament, as we call it, the, the Tanakh, knew the prophet Daniel and knew that in Daniel 7, Daniel had this vision of the judgment of God where Daniel saw uh, one like unto a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven to take over the government of the earth. And when Jesus made that claim, they just said, you've heard the blasphemy, crucify him. So why should I be ashamed? This is the way it appeals to me. Uh, if I put it bluntly, why should I be ashamed of, of talking about this when Jesus made it a central claim? And standing back from that, David, after all, it is the central hope of the gospel. And the nearer you get to the end of the New Testament, so to speak, the brighter it, it glows. Paul talked about it all the time. And at the very end of the book of Revelation, you have the church responding to the glory that they've seen. And saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. And I felt, right, I am going to try to say things about this. And, you know, I've been enormously encouraged in the many, many Zoom interviews I've had about this book that people latch on to this. But they latch on to it, even the secular people that have interviewed me. They find it absolutely fascinating because, of course, they've never heard it before. So doing that unapologetically becomes, to my mind, uh, another way of defending Christianity. Yes, indeed. Fascinating. Uh, and, and really, for those of you who, who perhaps haven't read the book yet, I, I would very much in, encourage you to do that. The, the, the title, 2084, um, it's obviously a, a reference to Orwell's 1984. And um, of course, there, what we find is a, a dystopian future um, where there is control by a totalitarian state and, and so forth. Um, now, this is, of course, one of the concerns that has been raised about the direction that artificial intelligence is going. And a, a lot of the scenarios um, are, are are quite negative in in this way, um, so I overall looking at artificial intelligence is, is this your assessment? Um, do you think? I mean, obviously there, as you've already mentioned, there are some very positive aspects to it, but there are also ethical concerns and so forth. So um, overall, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the direction that AI is going in? Oh, I'm very wary of generalizations but it's interesting you know the title was given to me by a very strong atheist <laughs> <laughs> which will interest many of you because you probably all of you've heard of him his name is peter atkins <laughs> and he's the professor of physical chemistry at oxford and i've debated him several times some of them very vitriolic debates as you will see if you Google his name and mine on the internet. But Peter and I were traveling in a car together to Southampton University to do a debate, which was, well, it was one of the most over the top uh, debates I've ever been involved in earlier uh, this year. And he said, we're not gonna talk about the debate. And I said, no, Peter, we're not. So he said, what are you writing? And I told him, oh, he said, I've got a title for you. And I said, what is it, Peter? He said, 2084. <laughs> well, I said, I was immediately struck with the appropriateness of it. And I said, Peter, if I use it, I, I will acknowledge you for it. And I do in the book. But you're right. The interesting thing about Orwell's book if you think of the phrases that have come into the English language, like Big Brother and so on, all of these things are happening. Mm -hmm. The developments in narrow artificial intelligence, and perhaps I should just briefly say that narrow AI is the stuff we're familiar with. 
It's a system consisting of a, a powerful computer, a large database, and a program that recognizes certain patterns. For example, uh, you take a million x-rays of people's lungs and get the top experts in the world to label them with the diseases. And then my x-ray is taken. And this system will very rapidly compare mine with the million and tell me what's wrong with me. Now, the important thing there is to realize this is artificial intelligence. And I met a lovely man in his 80s who was one of the pioneers of this. And he wrote a famous paper. Where I love the title of it. It's this, the artificial in artificial intelligence is real. In other words, it only simulates intelligence. That system does something, a single thing, that normally requires human intelligence to do. It is not itself intelligent. The intelligent people are the doctors and the programmers and the designers of the computer. And that kind of thing is, of course, extremely powerful, is being used to do research on COVID vaccine, for example. And we can applaud that because we're very grateful for that kind of development in medicine. But then, as it goes on, the ethical problems rise. So I wanted to point out that many of the things that Orwell predicted have come true. Some of them are good and some of them raise very big problems. But the thing to be grasped is this. It's not just the science fiction type, artificial general intelligence that raises those questions. AGI is the idea that will eventually either enhance existing human beings to be super intelligent, or we will construct some kind of system that can simulate everything a human being can do, but do it much better. You don't have to go that far until you have the facial recognition technologies which are being used in Xinjiang and China at the moment. And uh, it looks as if there's a very serious oppression going on. And here's the dilemma, David. And I'd love your comments on, on where you see it going. It's wonderful to be able to recognize criminals in a football crowd or terrorists in a railway station. But it's another thing when you subject a, a minority population to rigorous and constant investigation and if they don't live up to the norms as perceived by the government, they end up in re-education camps or, or worse. So what we're dealing with is an explosion of ethical problems. And my observation is, and please comment on it, that our major problem is that the technology is developing far faster than the ethical underpinning or assessment of this kind of thing. Yes, I mean that, that that certainly seems right to me. I, I think that there are there are so many different issues raised by AI. Um, some as you've talked about in, in terms of uh, the nature of of thought and uh, intelligence and, and so forth. But I think a lot of these ethical issues really are, are are huge. And in a sense, they're they're not specifically related to AI. I mean, I I tend to be. Uh, Bit of a skeptic about AI in the sense that that really a lot of this uh, a lot of AI the successes of AI is is due to very good statistical algorithms that are very effective and you you talk about that in, in your book as well but but the challenge here I, I suppose is that some of these technologies have been so successful that our application of them uh, we, we tend to go ahead sometimes with the application without thinking through the ethical issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a point you, you draw out in your book about really the need to be looking at the ethical foundations of, of what we're doing with the technology. And I suppose this is always a concern that's raised by, by many technologies, and AI is just a very specific example of this, is the ethical use of those technologies. We, we can't just say because we can do it, we, we should yeah. do it. And yeah. um, I, I think it's very difficult to try to get that right framework without having a, the right conceptual framework for thinking about what a human being really is, which of course is central to your, your book as well. 
It is. And what you just said raises a huge issue because ethics is largely worldview dependent. Mm -hmm. And if I regard human beings simply as a, a transient or transit uh, station on the way of becoming something else, and all of that has been guided, well, not guided, it has arisen by simply by the natural unguided processes in nature, then, of course, there's a huge temptation to do what you suggest. If we can do it, let's do it. But if you regard human beings as bearing the image of God in any sort of meaningful sense, then to start reprogramming them and doing various things with them is another matter altogether. But even at the lower level, as you say, of what is going on at the moment with, with narrow artificial intelligence, what ethical view are we going to bring to it? And it's obvious to me that if you take the atheist worldview to its extreme, as Dawkins very helpfully does for us, and his famous statement that this world is just, I'm paraphrasing, is just what you'd expect it to be if at bottom there is no good, no evil, and, and no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. You see, he's emptying the world of any kind of a moral base, and it's likely to end up purely subjective and purely relative. Well, now, from a Christian perspective, it is very different. And I think we really need to think through very hard what our own ethical position is. And more difficult than that, learn to articulate it so that people understand what we're talking about. And for me, it's very important to read people like Nietzsche who had a very deep influence and who could see that if you got rid of God, you got rid of morality. And many a Russian has said to me during my time visiting there, we thought we could get rid of God and keep a value for human beings. And we found out too late that we couldn't. So our challenge from the perspective of persuasive evangelism or apologetics, if I might use that dreaded word, is to articulate our ethical beliefs. And every discipline, every academic discipline, just thinking of those in the academics network just for a moment, every discipline raises ethical questions. And we need to think through them at, at much more than a trivial level so that we can contribute to the discussion with those who are around us. It's hugely important. And we can see in people like Elon Musk, for instance, and even the late Stephen Hawking, worry about these things. And all one can do is to do what one can, but... We need to spend time thinking about what is our ethical system. Mm. We're competing against Peter Singer, particularly with his preference utilitarianism. And we need to think through what our ethical beliefs are. What is Christian ethics? Yes, I mean, it, it does seem to me that this is another area where there is a, a real opportunity for Christians in the sense that I think AI is throwing up a lot of a lot of big questions that people are concerned about, um, and I, th I think one of the difficulties is that many people, perhaps, although they're concerned about some of these developments and the direction in which AI is going and the applications that the technology might be used for, they they have concerns, but they. And I'm talking about secular people. They, they have concerns, but sometimes perhaps don't know how to articulate them. Their worldview doesn't really enable them to to express their reservations, yet they, they still have them. And it does seem to me that that's a real opportunity to do the sort of thing you have been doing and to say, well, here's what a Christian worldview offers you. And it does help you to articulate some of these concerns. It's a huge that's a huge opportunity, especially when people are openly concerned and even frightened 
uh, and realize that they've got no basis, they've got no rock on which to stand, and to gently point out to them that this is inevitable when you relativize God or relativize the absolute, so to speak, and that they are inwardly, as human beings, evidencing that there's something more. What I mean by that, David, is Paul made a very interesting statement at the beginning of Romans. He legitimizes in chapter one the drawing conclusions from nature about God. Uh, and that, of course, is very important for those of us interested in the science and religion debate. But in the second chapter, he talks about human beings as moral beings. But the way he does it, I've always found fascinating that he refers to normal human behavior. And we see it in children and adults, whatever they believe, that they accuse each other. They say, that's not fair. You shouldn't have done that. And Paul's point is that they are evidencing that there's something transcendent already written in their hearts. They've got a conscience. And if you hit me and I say that's not fair, I'm really implying to anybody watching that you should accept my moral standards. In other words, they're outside of both of us. And I think that is something that we can use uh, judiciously to help people to think about the implications of their own worldview. I prefer to do it more by questioning and uh, rather than telling them what the Christian worldview is, but saying, does this lead to that, et cetera, et cetera, so that they get some sort of framework to do a bit of perhaps for them unusual self-criticism and evaluation. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I think the the whole area that we've been discussing about ethics and morality and a framework of moral for morality that's obviously important in in both of your books that we're we're discussing today. And I mean, I would love to discuss AI with you longer, and we could we could discuss such things as the the Turing test and uh, computational theories of mind and uh, consciousness and so forth. But but alas, our time is is too short. And I would like to turn uh, now for a little bit of time to, to look at your book on, on coronavirus and some of the issues you raise there. When we, we talk about morality, you distinguish between two types of suffering or evil, you, you distinguish between moral and natural evil. And so in, in the case of moral evil, we're talking about evil that's perpetrated by, by humans, really. Um, and at, at one level, that, of course, is um, perhaps we can make sense of that a little bit more easily because yeah. we are morally responsible agents. But of course, the real focus of your book on coronavirus is on natural evil or, or natural disasters. And, and you've you've dealt with this before, um, particularly in the context of the Christchurch earthquake um, in, in terms of natural disasters. And so I, I wondered if you wanted to, to comment just on the coronavirus issue itself. Did you come up with come across different issues that were arising in this context compared to some of your earlier responses to natural disasters? I, I find that it, it's very similar uh, because the, the central question that people almost instantly come up with is if you're going to talk about God in this context, and you're going to talk about a powerful God and a God of love, you've immediately arrived in a contradiction. And it's very difficult to get rid of that contradiction. And this is, of course, what David Hume alluded to, and he went back to Epicurus and, and so on. And that forms the main thrust, I think. And I would want to approach that with great sensitivity because not only there are there two kinds of suffering, but there are two perspectives on it. Uh, there's one, uh, the perspective of the observer who hasn't got COVID and is watching it. There's the other of the person who's got it and may die from it. Uh, 
And those are two very different perspectives. And I think we need to approach this with extreme sensitivity. Unfortunately, we've got wonderful models in the New Testament, particularly in, in the life of our Lord. But inevitably, we're going to face, I mean, it's most interesting in a simple nuclear family situation in John's gospel, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and Lazarus gets ill and Jesus is not there. And they sent him a message, Lord, the one you love is ill. And they expected him to come and he doesn't come. And they have to watch him die, as many have had to watch their loved ones die uh, under COVID. So it's a similar situation. But the striking thing is when Jesus turns up, Martha first says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, you've got the power to deal with this and you weren't here and you didn't. And we understood it's unspoken, but it's clear in the context, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. We've got to read the whole story according to John against the background that Jesus loved them. So there is Hume's problem straight away. Uh, you got the power. If you'd been here, you could have done it. So the unspoken thing is, what about your love? And Jesus addressed that point blank with the amazing statement, your brother shall rise again. Oh, yes, she said, having been theologically quite well schooled. She was a bright cookie, was Martha. He will rise at the, at the last day at the judgment. And Jesus says, look, I'm not talking about that. I am the resurrection. And uh, the person who lives and believes in me, even though they die, yet will they live? Do you believe this? And that was a tremendous challenge. And I would want to bring that in eventually into this. But at that point, Mary arrives. She says exactly the same thing as Martha. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then she starts to cry. And Jesus does not enter into a theological discussion with her. He starts to weep as well. And I really do think, David, that some of us, we need to learn to weep. There is a real place for getting alongside people. Now, that doesn't answer the question that I have raised. The, if people want answers, sometimes they only want sympathy at the moment. They want a loving arm around them if you were allowed to touch them. That's the tragedy of these days. But sooner or later, we want to think the thing through. And the next question is, could not God have made a world in which things didn't go wrong? There were no tsunamis, earthquakes, cancers, COVID-19. Now, that is a question that applies at the moral level. But you're right. It's even more difficult at the level of what we call natural evil, although that's almost a contradiction in terms. And I say to people, look, just think briefly about the moral evil question. If you want a world in which people uh, couldn't um, injure each other or harm each other, then uh, God could have created a world like that. Of course, it would be a world full of robots and automata, but you would not have been in it. Now, this I found a great opportunity. People say, what do you mean I wouldn't have been in it? Well, I said, you're in a world where you are capable of love. And that capacity comes from the fact that God has gifted you with this marvelous ability within limits to choose, to say yes or to say no. And he could have created a world in which there was no morality and these things didn't happen, but you would not have been in it. And often people say to me, well, God took a risk then. And I said, yes, and so do you every time you have a child. And I can recall vividly, I don't know how it came into my head, when I held my first child, little girl, in my hands, and I thought, you could grow up to reject me. Why have children? Well, we know the answer to that. We trust that under God's help, if we're Christians, they'll grow up to love us, one of the most rewarding things in the universe. So there is a sense in which the build of human beings is a very real clue to where we should look, but we need to look further than human beings. This is 
not a fracture in human nature, it's a fracture in nature itself. But the book of Genesis connects the two. And however we understand it, it's clear that something is wrong with the world. And that is what Genesis claims, the, the thorns and the thistles and the viruses. And that leads us again to something even more problematic. I'll stop with this because you may want to go further. Most viruses are beneficial. and In fact, they're necessary for life. Tectonic plates are necessary for life. And yet there appear to be a number of rogue viruses and people build houses in seismic areas. And so we end up with people saying, why couldn't God have made fire so that it warmed and it didn't burn? And again and again, I'll finish with this. We've argued this. Surely a good God and a powerful God would have done this, would have made it like that. I have never been in such an argument that's come up with a satisfactory answer. And here the mathematician in me takes over and says, look, you may not be getting an answer because you're not asking the right question. And one of the key questions I found to put to people that leads to a lot of further discussion is this. And I say, this is just as hard as the question you've asked me. It's this, is there anywhere any evidence that there's a God that we could trust with that fracture. What I'm saying is every worldview has to face the fact that we live in a mixed universe. I call it beauty and barbed wire or beauty and bombs or beauty and COVID-19. We see good things, we see bad things. Now, that's the fact. So we got to face it. Is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God that we could trust with that ultimately, since there are no simplistic answers. And then, of course, I talk to them about the God who suffers and about Christ's resurrection, which, of course, gives a different perspective on death and offers something to COVID-19 patients that atheism cannot offer, which is not necessarily a cure, but the hope of the resurrection. So that's a very compact version of what I try to put in the book. Yeah, that's that's extremely helpful, John. Thank you, thank you so much for um, for summarising that that for us. Uh, one of the things I found very helpful is the distinction, and you you alluded to, to it earlier about distinguishing between different responses that we need to the problem of evil, whether moral or natural. So you, you discuss the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual dimensions to this. And so it, it strikes me that one of the things that's interesting about what, what you say is that the in, in terms of responding intellectually to the problem of, of suffering, uh, there, there are responses that Christians can give. And I, I thought your discussion about um, viruses and so on was fascinating, just as, as with uh, the earthquakes and, and so forth as well. Um, and, and I suppose to some extent these answers are, are helpful in addressing the intellectual question to some extent, but of course there's, there's no complete explanation as to why God allows a, a particular example of, of suffering. But when you turn to this further question about whether there's a God we can trust, I, I think sometimes people perhaps will look at this as just moving away from the intellectual question and moving just to the emotional question. But it seems to me that in, in the way you've described it and the way you've written about it, that these two come together in, in Christianity because we actually look at, at, at Jesus, we look at his suffering, uh, we look at his resurrection, and th this addresses the emotional question to some extent, but, but it's not as if we have turned away from the evidence because, because there is good evidence that these things are true. And so in a, in a sense, Christianity helps to bring these things together. Yeah, I I think that's right. And it's it's so important to say to people, we don't have any simplistic formula or anything like that. In the end, there are deep mysteries connected with it. And it's why I put the question the way I do. Is there sufficient evidence to trust God? And the fact is throughout history, millions of people have found that that is so. And I often reflect 
on the point that C.S. Lewis made long ago that most of the Christian centuries, people have lived without dental anesthetic. And, you know, uh, that gives its own answer. And I think they need to be put in the context of the alternative because the atheist view is just to say, well, that's just it. Um, it's a brute fact. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere here and you've got to accept it. And it shows that there is no God. But I think there are real intellectual questions there because if you deduce from it, there's no God. And you're saying, I do not believe in God because of this natural evil or moral evil. I want to know where you get your concept of evil from. And in the Russian context, Dostoevsky made a very perceptive comment in the brothers Karamazov for it is said, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. Now, of course, he didn't mean that atheists couldn't behave morally. Of course they can. They can even put Christians to shame. But what he meant was get rid of God and there's no base for morality. And that's exactly what Nietzsche said. And so the atheist solution has the effect of apparently getting rid of an intellectual problem. But I've noticed it doesn't get rid of the suffering, but it most assuredly gets rid of ultimate hope. Now, it may be true. As I put it Dawkins once, I said, this is pretty grim. Well, he said, yes, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. And I said, no, but it doesn't mean it is true either. We need to look for evidence that goes deeper than that. And so I want to turn to not one particular piece of evidence, but the whole cumulative story of God in the great drama of the Bible. And as I get older, David, I, I really do appeal to Christians to get to know the big picture and not to be afraid to investigate those bits of the big picture that we find disturbing. And one of them, of course, is the origin of natural evil. We do find that disturbing. C.S. Lewis, as I point out in the book, has some very interesting things to say about it, but I'm not going to go into them now. Yes, thank, thank you, John. Um, it, it does seem to me that in, in both of these books, really you're getting to these fundamental questions about a Christian worldview. And, and what you've just said, I, I think is extremely helpful in that it, it really is the, the core message of, of the Christian faith that we want to communicate in, in this context and, and really understanding that story, understanding that worldview is, is really critical of what you're doing. Now, our, our, time is, our time is up, um, unfortunately, and I would love to discuss these things more. But could, could I ask you, just in, in closing, um, just on this point, um, there are many listening to this who are involved in missions uh, across Europe, involved in university outreaches and, uh, and, and so forth, as well as in academic work. And I wonder if you can just expand on that a little bit. You, you've talked about the importance of that. And, and could you comment briefly on, on just steps that we could take to do that, to really ground ourselves in that Christian worldview so that we are better equipped to take these opportunities and to present this message in the, in the world we live in? Well, I think the way to ground ourselves is firstly to listen to the world around us, listen to their questions, listen to what they're saying. Many younger people particularly get very daunted when they meet folks like us who have got considerable many years experience of communicating Christian truth. But we need to start small. I started very small. I took the questions that I found my fellow students asking and I concentrated on each of them individually and sought to get to a biblical view of a sensible answer and discussed it with them. And then I would have another question. And so I would build it up. Don't be daunted and learn to ask more questions than you answer. But above all, learn to be absolutely open with people. You will face many questions as I do. 
that you can't answer. Be honest and say, look, I'm sorry, I haven't even heard that question before, but I'd love to think about it. Would you give me a week to think about it and then we'll have a cup of coffee? And that demonstrates to people that we're not inhuman or superhuman. Um, saying that we've got answers to every question, that we're normal people and we're wrestling with these problems as well. And to show that kind of empathy. And in fact, if you don't mind me saying, I, I was so concerned about this barrier that many of us, and not just younger ones, are up against, the fear barrier. What happens if they find me out that I don't know everything? that I have written a little book recently. It's the cheapest book you'll ever get. It's called Have No Fear. And it really is based on Peter's encouragement to us. Always to be ready to give an answer to those who ask us a reason concerning the hope that is within us. It was many years before I realized that that statement is not about preaching. It's about a context in which people are asking you a question about your hope. And what we need to do is to work out ways of stimulating other people to ask us rather than stabbing them with the gospel when we don't even know what they think. But thank you so much to all of you for listening. I've immensely enjoyed uh, chatting to you, David. And God bless all of you as we try to fulfill as God has equipped us to go into all the world and to get this marvelous good news out. Th thank you so much, John. This has been incredibly helpful. I'm, I'm sure many people have been encouraged and, and blessed and equipped and perhaps challenged also to explore many of, of these issues. Thank you for the resources you have uh, provided through these books, as well as many of your online resources and for taking the time to, to share with us at at Foyer, and not only for all of those things, but also for the example that you have set us uh, in terms of engaging with these issues so that, that, that we can try to follow that example in the work we do, whether we're working in universities or in whatever context. So thank you very much, John. And to finish now, I'm going to hand over to Lindsay Brown, the director of Foyer. Thank you. Well, thank you, John and uh, David. It's always a highlight of our conference together when we have some interaction uh, which brings together the academics and the evangelists at our annual conference. We're so sorry that this is the only occasion where we're able to meet uh, with you uh, because we're online this year. We hope that next year we'll be able to have academics and university evangelists meet together. We've actually uh, booked 250 places in a hotel just south of Barcelona, in the hope that we will actually be able to meet together uh, face to face and that uh, we'll have a vaccine or some means that will facilitate that face to face meeting together at the end of October next year. We'll be in touch shortly uh, with more details uh, about that. Um, it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, the thinking behind uh, these two streams with. Uh, within FOIA, that is the streams for university evangelists, generally people coming from outside to communicate and proclaim the gospel in partnership with student groups, as well as uh, a body of academics who seek to bear witness to Christ within the university. That, that concern or that desire has arisen because some historians argue that somewhere around the middle of the, the, 19, uh, the 19th century, Generally speaking, evangelicals retreated from uh, engagement with the world, uh, faced with the rising tide of secularism. Um, it seemed that many evangelicals held their hands up and uh, retreated from uh, engagement uh, in the world. And it consequently led, according to John Stott in one of his books, to what he calls memorably a guilty silence. Foyer was established with the objective of responding uh, to that guilty silence and encouraging believers to take on uh, alternative worldviews in the context of the university with the objective, the twofold objective of firstly, demonstrating the superiority of the biblical worldview over other worldviews. And as we do so, opening the doors for us to proclaim more directly 
the gospel of Jesus uh, Christ. And our sense was that we needed to do both. We needed to engage in the public square, in universities, television, newspapers, uh, media, radio, and so on, in order to, if you like, win the argument in public about the superiority of the biblical worldview, opening doors uh, to proclaim the gospel. It was interesting that John used the word there, the, the sufficiency of the biblical worldview. Uh, Francis Schaeffer used to say that um, the Bible doesn't give us exhaustive answers to all people's questions, but it gives us sufficient in order to believe. And moreover, it gives us the best answers to the big questions in life. In order for this to happen, our conviction is that three things need to take place. Firstly, as John just said, uh, we as believers need to uh, walk around the universities uh, of Europe and try to understand, to listen, to see where people are coming from. Sometimes it may even re be involved reading some of the books, like Noah Hariri's books that John referred to, referred to earlier, in order that we might understand where the ideas which influence and shape many people's thinkings, thinking are coming from. That's harder for some of us than for others. But if we're to follow the example of not only John and David this afternoon, but dare I say that the Apostle Paul in Mars Hill, we need to do some thinking, looking, reading, trying to understand. But secondly, we need to develop a partnership. We can't do this on our own. And our con growing conviction has been over the last decade that we need everybody on board. We need a partnership of men and women. We need a partnership of people within countries. We need a partnership of people in IFES and other agencies, because even though IFES has some very fine people, it doesn't have all the best people in Europe. We need to work in partnership. And paramountly this afternoon, we would say we need a partnership of public evangelists and academics to work together. Ajit Fernando memorably uh, said uh, last night that we need to, to develop communities of grace. Uh, believers from both these networks who are working in partnership to communicate uh, the gospel in the context of the university. And thirdly, we need courage. We need to inspire and encourage one another through our friendships, not working in isolation, but in partnership to stand firm in speaking the gospel of Christ into this context. Courage to do what Wesley called offering Christ to the people something he wrote in his diaries nearly every day of his 50 years of public ministry. I offered Christ to the people today. It's not just enough to deconstruct alternative worldviews. As that opens doors, so we need to go further in proclaiming and speaking of the uniqueness and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rebecca Marley Pippert quoted a beautiful verse, striking verse from the Psalms earlier this week, uh, which reads something like um, follows, when the foundations are shattered or broken down, how then should the righteous live and speak? And I think part of the answer is to stop, listen, look, understand. Secondly, partner. Thirdly, courageously seek to live and speak for Christ. So the verse I would love to leave with you all as we conclude our joint uh, meeting at this conference is from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, where the Apostle Paul, after giving evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, writes to the Corinthian church. And I think this echoes down the generations to those of us who are academics and evangelists or both in the 21st century. Brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in his service is not in vain. Well, may God give us grace to heed and follow that exhortation in the coming year. COVID-19 uh, breaks up or challenges secular dominance and its answers to the big questions. And it may be that we have a special opportunity in the coming months, both online, in person, and hopefully in public, to explain and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God help us to do so. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful partnership of academics and evangelists. Help us to encourage one another to partner together 
and to courageously speak of uh, the biblical worldview and its superiority over other alternative worldviews and then speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the hope for the nations. But we ask it in his name with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Those of you who are academics, the evangelists tonight have, um, have an acoustics evening with music from all around Europe. We're really looking forward to it and having Michael Ott share the gospel too. Join us this evening if any of you are free. We meet at uh, uh, 8 o'clock Central European time, 7 o'clock UK time. Hope to see some of you there.